When you tell a gag, you've got to tell it as the ordinary man in the street would talk, and even lawyers. You know, these lawyers and solicitors and dentists and, and judges. I've been to, you know, I've, I've appeared at Oxford University, and I've appeared at Liverpool University, and you know, they and they, and they use the F word and the C word, and it's, 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 and some of them it's it's like music when some of them say, you know, really posh, you know, oh fucking hell, all that. You know. Then lad says, "Is that where the babies come from, Dad?" He said, "The stork." He said, "Who fucks the stork?" <laughs> A gag like this would be no use without the F word. It would be no use without the F word. It's two Irish fellas going through uh, through the Vatican, and once that, I think that fellow over there with the crooked stick and the mitre cap, I think that's the Pope. His mate said, I don't think it is. He says, I'm sure it is. He says, I'll go and ask him. And he went over, he says, Are you the Pope? He says, Fuck off. He went back, he said, What did he say? He said, He wouldn't commit himself. So without that F word, that gag would be just a waste of time and it wouldn't be a waste of time. It's no use saying bugger off and it's no use saying take a walk or take a hike. It's got to be the Pope saying fuck off. Swearing, drinking, anything like that, he was totally against in the house. And to this day, I can't recall really ever swearing in front of him, believe it or not. Never swear at home, never swear in front of my grandchildren. They'll see all my videos when, I, when they get older. And I'm hoping they're broad-minded enough to realise that that's the era that I had to get my living in. And that's why I had to do to fill theatres and fill clubs and make my club a success for 40 years and make them live in a beautiful home with beautiful cars and want for nothing. Wasn't that clean? Well, I don't tell dirty gags. I don't tell, I don't tell sick gags and I don't tell... Uh, Jokes about hemorrhoids or tampaxes and, and stuff like that. I don't want to know about that. And, you know, I'll mention tits. I've been in the room when he's been watching Joe, Joe Brand, who I think of a, as a kind of anti-matter Bernard. Um, and, and he just, he, he can't believe it. His mouth is actually open. What he's, how does this ever get on the television? It's disgusting. Um... So Bernard draws his own you know, line in the sand, like most of us do. He has he has a moral code. Um, it's just not the same as other people. A woman went to the vicar. She said, "Vicar, I must tell you that I lost my temper this morning. I called the man a fucking bastard this morning." He said, "My God, there's no justification for that." She said, "Well, he put his hands on my breasts." He said, "You mean like this?" <laughs> I've not forgot other son. Eh? I've not forgot. <laughs> She says, yes. He said, there's still no justification for that. She said, well, give me one. He said, you mean like this when he gets on the job and he's banging away there? She said, yes, and he's giving me AIDS. He said, the fucking butt. As I say, if you don't like Bernard Manning, you just switch him off. What time's he going out this fucking hell, eh? You'll have to put it on at one o'clock in the morning. I was in Bradford last week. I felt like a spot on a domino. <laughs> they wait for it to snow in Yorkshire so they can count the population. <laughs> Down 999 to get the Bengal answers in. <laughs> now, you see, would you say that that, that kind of humour is dangerous? I think racist jokes are dangerous, yes. In my mind was very clearly the fact that humour makes prejudice acceptable, makes people comfortable with their worst feelings for each other. Racism becomes uh, just another piece of entertainment. Uh, we laugh at them, they're subhuman. Let's laugh together. You know and I know that every anti-Semite begins a sentence, some of my best friends are Jewish. So... Oh, not all of my friends are just some of them. I, know. <laughs> you know, I like a few Jews, there's some Jews I don't like. Shut, shut. <laughs> Welcome to the Eichmann trial. I'm getting it tonight. If you are an ethnic minority, you've got a certain vulnerability that other people don't have, and you can be wounded, and it can be felt. And that's one of the reasons why I don't like jokes or alleged jokes of this kind because I don't believe that the best kind of humour is there to wound people or upset them or to mock them. When you make a joke about black or coloured people to a white audience, suddenly the prejudice that they don't dare admit to is respectable. Suddenly they hear each other laughing, and it's no. comfortable. No, the joke's Well, you're breaking my heart, are you? What about the 
violin play, there you go. There is a point where it becomes the bully laughing at, at the, um, the fat child, the spotty child, the weak child, the vulnerable child. Which actually more stick than me with being fat. You know, they really give me some stick. So are you really, in a sense, trying to get back, do you think? Uh-huh. Why, why, is all, why are all your jokes based on hate? Why are you attacking all the time? Because he gets laughs. <laughs> he doesn't hate anybody, whatever the colour of the skin or anything else, but he uses it for fun, for a joke. When white people get together, we can enjoy ourselves, guys. <laughs> Ideas and words are, are very important. They're very powerful. They're lethal. You know, you just need to look at recent events in Europe, Bosnia, Kosovo, look in Africa, what happened in Rwanda, you know, genocide, and you've got a thing now called ethnic cleansing. It's amazing that the people feel that other people are so despicable that you can describe destroying them as cleansing, you know. So, to me, ideas and even ideas that come out of comedy are tremendously powerful, and you've got to be aware of what you're saying. I'm about as welcome here on this show tonight as a reggae band at a Klu Klux Klan meeting. <laughs> I'm not in any way an apologist for Bernard Manning, um, but I have been in a club when he's been at his most racist, and I've heard uh, and looked round uh, at many black people in there, and certainly lots of Irish people I knew were Irish, uh, were laughing louder than anyone else, and they paid to go in. Ah, oh, there's our coloured sisters there. Didn't see you till you smiled. You're right. <laughs> Lovely. She's thinking to herself, fuck off, you fat bastard. <laughs> As I've always said for the last 50 years, never take a joke seriously. It's a joke. All this uh, political correctness in, in offices, nobody can laugh anymore than the office workers. You can't pull a girl's leg no more, she can't pull your leg no more. Without, you know, harassment and all this carry on, it's a lot of nonsense. They're unbelievable, am I? <laughs> what they find about, they're all fucking white. What they want is, what they want is a million package dropping right in the middle of Belfast. Then they know they've got fucking problems. I thought this question was going to come up. Are you a racist? Now, my reply should have been, no, I'm not. Lots of my friends are black, or lots of my friends. She says, are you a racist? I said, yes. <laughs> oh, all of a sudden, she ain't got the answer. <laughs> That's not what I'm supposed to answer. See, I'm not a racist, but I won't. Instead of her winding me up, then the, the boot was on the other foot, I was winding her up. Bernard really believed that he'd given her a lambasting, and, of course, uh, whether uh, in the editing that, that was lost, I don't know or not, but I, I thought it was a bit silly to uh, say the things that he did on that. I, was, I don't know why he did it, because... Uh, He's not that sort of person at all. And I telephoned him the day after and I said, Bernard, for God's sake, what did you go on that damn programme for? It's perfectly obvious that you were set up. And he was set up. That programme was a disgrace to fair play and tolerance. Never let him stop you laughing. That's what it's all about. You're about to hear Bernard Manning as you would never hear him on television. Recorded secretly, talking about black people. They actually think they're English because they're f***ing That means if a dog's born in a stable, it's a f***ing <laughs> He could be arrested, but this was a party organised by policemen. Somebody in that audience had a tape recorder. I've got an idea who it was. I won't mention any names. He knows who it is. And he knows I know who it is. He had a tape recorder, and the same man shook my hand and put his arms round me and said how much he enjoyed the show, and sold the tape recorder to Granada and also the story to the News of the World. Got himself a nice £20,000 for it. Good luck to him. Good luck to him. When the police pull you up, you know, they must caution you. Remember that. They've got to caution you. I say to you, you're not obliged to say anything, but anything you do say will be taken down and used in evidence. <laughs> Your next sentence must be, please don't hit me again, officer. <laughs> Now, apart from the use of the word nigger is a little unusual on television these days, and uh, I wouldn't exactly condone it, but 
to me, that sounds like a joke about police brutality. He seems to be saying to, me, saying to, a, to an audience of policemen, you beat up black people, you don't treat them fairly. Uh, perhaps I'm giving him far too fair a hearing there. Perhaps, he, perhaps I should not take that, and perhaps I'm wrong in that analysis. But I've thought about it over a long period, and I'm convinced he's, he's, he's just an iconoclast. He has to upset his audience, whoever they are. I went to a Muslim strip show the other night, and they all shouted, show us your fucking face. He's had a lot of threats over the years from uh, different organisations. You know why seagulls have wings, my love? To beat the fucking gypsies to the tip. About two years ago, um, I think he was coming back from a place in Bolton one night, and um, the police rang me to tell me that um, they had a, a serious threat, which they considered to be um, um, pretty genuine. Uh, of somebody that was going to shoot him that night on his way home from Bolton uh, and the, the police actually had his garden staked out and uh, I actually got a message through to my dad to say just beware they don't the police really don't want you going back just yet they want to keep their eye on on the house and, and he just took no notice of me went straight back within 10 minutes of that phone call told me where to go got to the house and then shouted come out wherever you are if you're going to shoot me, do it now. So you're not going to, you're not going to change him. And, and the police just went, oh, just came out of the bushes and <laughs> got on with it. I don't take things serious. I'm not bothered. I'm not finally dying. I want to die in my sleep, but I'm not finally dying. I want to see all my family again. My wife was on a cruise. I wouldn't go away. I, I hate going away, but I never stopped Vera going away with Bernard. She used to go all over the world. And it was 10 to 8 one night, one Saturday night, and I got a phone call, and she was dying with a heart attack. And they flew her home in an ambulance. And I, 10 minutes later, I had to go on stage. How I did it, I'll never know. It was terrible. The day they die, you've got to go on stage. Because people sold tickets. I'd do it. Because once I got on, I used to forget everything. But once I come off, but it hit you like a bleeding poleaxe. Terrible. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for anybody that's going through bereavement at present or uh, any time in their lives. It's, it's a terrible thing, it's a terrible, terrible thing. So, uh, you get through, you get through, because my mother want, wouldn't want me to be morose or anything like that, but she'd say, get out there and do it, you know, because uh, you take you back to the days when we had an out. My mother died six years ago. Ever since, once a month at least, he's telephoned me, because he knows I live alone, he's telephoned me to see if I'm all right and that sort of thing. That's Bernard Manny. People hear him, and they really hear him. But he's such a generous and a kind man. Well, there's a, a great entertainer called Alan Randall, a great banjo player, George Formby. What will you get if you cross George Formby with Eddie Murphy? Like you don't know, dear. You? Turn out nice again, you <laughs> he was driving down to Torquay and his car broke down on a terrible rainy day and he's parked in a lay-by. Who comes past in laugh one but Bernard? So he got out of the car and said, uh, what's the matter, lad? You know, and he said, well, the car's broke down. He said, look, there's a flask of coffee in the, in the Cadillac. Go and get a coffee, I'll have a look at it. Rolled his sleeves up and went like that underneath the bonnet, mended the car, shut the bonnet, and went back in and Alan said, I'm going to tell the papers about this. And I said, don't you dare, you ruin my reputation. We have a saying, a friend in need is a bloody nuisance. <laughs> In his private life, and everyone would tell you this, he's a pussycat. The view is that, that Manning deliberately put on this hard, tough act because he was in a hard, tough business. It's fabulous. I love him. love him to death. I'd vote for him. I'd go anywhere if he asked me because he's given so much back to the people. I don't want to be too controversial, but often, you know, these show people say, oh, yeah, we'll come and do it for expenses only. Then when you get the expenses bill, you know, it can be 500 quid, 1,000 or whatever. I was saying to the Variety Club that Bernard was very generous and they said, well, do you know, Cyril, when he comes to do a dinner for deprived children or coaches or whatever it is, he doesn't charge us £1,000, he gives us £1,000. Bernard was the man when you ring him up, he would say, uh, never cost the national health a penny in my life. No, today he's not enjoying good health at all because you know he's he's uh, arthritic. He's got uh, diabetes, 
and he, he had a stroke. Leonard Rossiter didn't drink, didn't smoke, played squash every day, jogged every day, 47 years of age, fucked, dead and buried. <laughs> you mustn't treat your body like that. The doctor said, uh, I'd like you to ease up a bit. He said, I know it's like talking to the wall, he said, but I'd like you to ease up. And young Bernard, my son, who I love dearly, took over. He just said, get on with it, whatever you want to do. He said, get on with what you want to do with the Embassy Club because uh, it's your place now. And funnily enough, even now, he, he calls it my place. And I can't believe that. You know, he only spoke to me on the phone the other day and said, um, what's, what's going on at your place this weekend, you know? And I said, I can't relate to that at all. He's got two uh, fitted carpet and toilets and everything now. <laughs> it's really beautiful now. But he's still appearing there, you know, and he does one a month for me and he packs the place out still. Irish fella bought a chainsaw. He went back after a couple of days. He said, this chainsaw, he said, it's no fucking good to me, he said. You told me you'd cut 60 trees a day down. He says, I'm only doing 40. <laughs> it's fuck this saw, he said. Something's fucking wrong with it. He said, let's have a look at it. He pulled the string. He went... <laughs> he said, what's that fucking noise? Manning has survived because he was the best at what he did. All the others, and the, the city is full of clones of Bernard Manning trying to do the, his act, but they've never succeeded. You know, my ambition is to go live on the Antique Roadshow. <laughs> I'm saying to some old woman, you know that's worth? Fuck all. <laughs> Not a fucking carrot. <laughs> now, fuck off with it. <laughs> that live on Sunday night, don't want it. If Bernard were here, I'd say, Bernard, what a waste. You're a, a very gifted man. What a shame that you can't use all those gifts to... Uh, just to make us all laugh together. I don't believe in racialism or religion. I believe that all the Catholics and Jews and Protestants and Methodists should all get together and attack the Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> She's having a little laugh, because she knows I don't mean it. Anybody with any intelligence that goes to a good school can look at me and say, that is a big, fat, jolly guy, that. He couldn't mean it. He's not a racist. Don't get the wrong impression of him, because... Um... It's only an act. It really is only an act. When I die, I'd like on the grave... I should have been a sir, but I think it's something I said. <laughs>